Now today's webinar, so advance to the next slide, is the global importance of frailty and pre-frailty in middle-aged adults, a peer study. Let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Dale Leong. His current positions are as assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University, a staff cardiologist at the Hamilton Health Sciences, and an investigator in the Population Health Research Institute. Dr. Leong graduated from the University of Adelaide Medical School with Dean's Listing and honors for academic excellence in 2000. He completed his cardiology training, Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Public Health, and Master's of Biostatistics degree at the University of Adelaide, Australia. He has completed a postdoctorate fellowship in cardiovascular imaging at the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands before relocating to Canada. Dr. Leon has received a number of accolades, including the E.J. Morgan Campbell Career Award, McMaster University 2014, as a clinician scientist of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Ontario. He's published over 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, Circulation, European Heart Journal, Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and Blood. So now we welcome Dr. Leung to begin his talk. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time today and for joining me at your lunchtime uh, to hear, this, uh, hear our presentation and thoughts on uh, this topic. So to start with, and please do interrupt me if you have any questions or anything I say is uh, unclear or not coming across uh, well technically or uh, information-wise. But is that slide, they seem to be blank. Can anyone see the slides? So I have what is frailty and one ah, bullet point. There we go. Sorry, there was just a question. Quite a lengthy lag between when I click next and when the slide appears but there's the title slide that I see now so hopefully everyone can see that and so really the first question that I thought I would try to address is what is frailty and I think that everybody has uh, some conception of what frailty actually is you have a mental image of it but it can actually be defined uh, by something uh, like this definition here and there are numerous uh, examples of these types of definitions available uh, we could consider frailty and aging associated susceptibility or vulnerability to poor health outcomes when you're challenged by a physiological stressor. And so that makes a fairly good sense. The issue is really um, how can we measure this for the purposes of research? And I'll advance to the next slide, but it isn't appearing on my screen. Can you see the next slide at all? Here we are. It's just very slow. I apologize. It does seem to be laggy, but we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. So for the purposes of research, you know, we can actually measure frailty in a number of different ways. And if you look through the literature, there are at least 25 different scoring systems for frailty. And I think the important message that that tells us is that there is no perfect tool, there is no gold standard for evaluating whether an individual or a participant in a clinical study is actually frail. Uh, so with that in mind, what I thought I would do next is show you uh, when the slide appears, some of the approaches that we have adopted and that others have adopted as well. So for the purposes of our research, we uh, adopted two uh, different approaches to measuring frailty. And I think it's fair to say these are probably the two most widely cited approaches. The first is uh, an approach called a cumulative deficit approach or cumulative deficit index. And when you do this, what you do is you count for each individual in a, a study how many so-called deficits they have. And you express that as a proportion of uh, the number of deficits that you've counted in total. So you might count at least you know, 20 of these so-called deficits and ideally at least 30 to 40 of them. And I'll go into some more detail about what constitutes a deficit and what you can consider a deficit. But basically, these are symptoms or physical signs that are abnormal, uh, the presence of previous diseases or laboratory abnormalities. Because you're expressing these deficits as a proportion of the number of deficits counted, you then have a ratio or a fraction at the end of your count. And this fraction is what's known as your cumulative deficit index. And typically, uh, there are thresholds that have been described in the literature uh, 
whereby if you have less than one-tenth of 0.1 of the counted deficits, you are considered non-frail. If you have more than 0.21 or some references more than 0.25 uh, a deficit index, so more than a quarter of the deficits that are counted, you are considered frail. And between those, you can be considered a state called pre-frail, which is between uh, being non-frail and being frail. So that's one approach there. The other approach is uh, what has been called a phenotypic approach, where uh, you measure a number of uh, characteristics uh, that each participant has, uh, so their phenotype, if you like, and uh, you can count them up as well. So for instance, with the uh, the classic uh, phenotypic approach that was described by Linda Free almost 20 years ago, you measure muscle strength, and if less than uh, uh, the lowest quintile muscle strength you're considered, uh, that's considered to be a low strength. Uh, you can measure physical activity in various ways, including a physical activity questionnaire. You can measure gait speed uh, with a number of uh, tests of, of walking speed. Typically, for instance, uh, one might use a time to get up and go test. Um, and there are simple questions that you can ask to see if uh, an individual has uh, lost weight unexpectedly. And the sort of threshold that might be used would be, say, four kilograms weight loss unintentionally over the past 12 months or so. And lastly, we ask about exhaustion, which is very much a subjective uh, complaint that an individual might have, uh, whether or not someone uh, has that. And so, so according to Fried's initial description, if you had three or more of these characteristics of, uh, of frailty, you were considered to be frail. And if you exhibited one or two of these characteristics, you were pre-frail, and none of the characteristics, you were considered non-frail. I'm just waiting for the slide to tick over. I hope that's going to take over. Is, is anyone able to see the next slide? They're actually coming through pretty well for me. but Are um, they? Yeah, yeah, they're really not for me. So um, what I might actually do is I'm going to, if, if everyone's able to actually see these slides except me, it may be my internet connection. I'm going to open up the uh, presentation separately so I can actually see what I presume that you're seeing as well. <laughs> So the next slide that I have uh, should be um, a slide asking the question, what constitutes a deficit uh, in this cumulative uh, deficit index? Um, and so basically, uh, as I said before, these um, what I've listed here are the properties of something that you might want to consider as counting as a potential deficit in uh, a cumulative deficit index that you're generating. Um, it, a deficit should increase with age, but it should not saturate too early. And what we mean by that is we're looking for characteristics that tend to become more common as you get older, but we don't want them to be so common or develop so quickly that everyone by the time of, say, middle age has it. Okay. Secondly, um, you want these deficits to be associated with health. So, for example, there isn't a very strong association between, uh, I don't know, the presence of uh, wrinkly skin and uh, health outcomes, hypothetically, let's say. Uh, so even though wrinkles do increase with age, uh, they're not specifically associated with health, and so they would not be an appropriate thing to count as a deficit, as an example. Uh, thirdly, we like the deficits to really cover in total a range of bodily systems. So you don't, for instance, want all your deficits to be focused on just the heart. Uh, you want to ensure that you uh, gather information about uh, a range of physiologic parameters uh, for an individual. And lastly, most deficits are considered binary. So if you have them, then you get a score of one for that, uh, that uh, de deficit. And if you don't have it, you don't get anything for that deficit. But some can obviously be weighted. As an example, um, uh, you might consider muscle strength. Uh, I think we generally accept that the stronger you are, the greater your muscle strength, uh, the better your physical condition. And so you might choose, if you're measuring hand grip strength or muscle strength in, in participants, to divide up uh, that one point that you lot for muscle strength into a range. So for instance, if someone is in the top quintile of muscle strength, you might say that they have a score of one. If they're in the second quintile, a score of 0.75, the third quintile, you know, a score of 0.5, and, and so forth there. 
So those are the sorts of ways that we approach uh, trying to sort out what could be considered a, a deficit and how to use it in a cumulative deficit index. So on the next slide, I've actually uh, shown some examples. As I've indicated on this slide for the cumulative deficit index, I think at least 30 to 40 deficits are desirable. And the sorts of things that may be quite uh, uh, relevant to include in such an index include, for example, a past history of things like cancer or myocardial infarction, uh, subjective uh, feelings that the participant might express, like feeling depressed, uh, feeling uh, fatigued, and so forth. Uh, you can include um, uh, functional parameters. So, for instance, if they respond yes to needing help dressing or yes uh, to difficulty uh, climbing stairs, that would be considered a deficit. And finally, you might consider actual physical measurements like group strength that you can, can take or blood pressure. Um, and as I kind of alluded to before, what may not be appropriate for a cumulative deficit index is uh, things like needing glasses because we know that it's very common by the time you're middle-aged or older to need glasses and so that really doesn't discriminate between someone who's more frail and someone who's less frail. And similarly, hair color is something that increases with age uh, it doesn't necessarily saturate too early, but it's not specifically associated with health and so uh, is not so relevant for a cumulative deficit index. So hopefully that gives you some insight and clarity into how we construct these things. So on the next slide, uh, what you've seen, uh, what I've demonstrated is a group strength as an example of um, uh, a measurement that might be included in uh, the phenotypic index. So I'm actually turning my attention now uh, to how we construct a free type of uh, frailty index based on a participant's uh, physical measurements and characteristics. And the point I wanted to make with this slide is to address the question, how do you determine that someone has low grip strength or low muscle strength? Strength. Because we've indicated in that Freed Index, you might recall, that low muscle strength is one of the five criteria that you use. And I wanted to make the point that this is not entirely clear. What people have traditionally done is taken uh, uh, folks with the lowest group strength for their sex and for their height um, and used that to determine whether they score a point on the uh, phenotypic index of frailty or not. The challenge that we face, uh, faced uh, in our uh, research was that, as you can see from these graphs, in both men and women, muscle strength actually varies not just with age, as I alluded to before, but also with uh, where you come from and what your ethnicity is. So you can see that, uh, for instance, folks of Europe, uh, from Europe and North America have significantly higher muscle strength for the same sex and age compared to folks from South Asia on the graph, uh, you know, on the graph presented there. And so what we don't really know, and because uh, global research into frailty, I think is something that's uh, fair to say is in its uh, infancy, uh, we don't know whether we should use one global cutoff for uh, individuals of a particular sex and age to determine what low muscle strength is, or whether we should use uh, ethnicity specific cutoffs, for example. Uh, so this is something that we need to do further research on, uh, and we haven't completely resolved. So while that might not ex exactly help you with uh, research that you are doing, uh, it is something that needs to be thought of and needs to be, I think, evaluated in a couple of different ways uh, through sensitivity analyses. On the next slide, you see a similar principle that comes to physical activity. So this is data uh, from the PURE study that I'll describe in more detail later on that Scott Lears published. And again, it shows that there is substantial uh, heterogeneity amongst countries of different income as to what level of physical activity is considered normal. So you see that in high-income countries, some of us surprise, uh, folks in general are more physically active than in lower-income countries, and also the source of that physical activity varies. So recreational physical, acti physical activity is seen almost exclusively in high-income countries, much less in lower-income countries. And so again, when you refer back to that free, uh, that free frail index and you ask yourself, is a particular participant low physical activity or not? The next question is, what cutoff do we use for physical activity? Do we use a, a reference range that is really catered towards high income countries? Or should we use something that's specific to where an individual comes from? And the truth is that uh, 
you know, levels of physical activity have not been studied as well in low-income countries as compared to high-income countries. And so those reference ranges, if you're going to use country-specific reference ranges, are a little unclear. So these are some of the challenges that we currently face and that we need more research to try to clarify there. So having given you that kind of background about how we evaluate frailty and what some of the challenges are, I think the next question that's pretty intuitive is how common is it? And really the answer to that question is that it depends. It depends, as I kind of uh, have been uh, talking about, how you actually measure it. And it also depends what population you're looking at. So on this next slide here, we uh, demonstrate uh, some of the other uh, previous work that's uh, looked into the estimates of uh, frailty prevalence. And there are a number more of these that I haven't presented. But I think you're going to get the idea that most of these studies come from older men and women uh, from North America predominantly and to a lesser extent uh, Europe. Um, the other thing to take away is that all of these studies evaluate frailty in different ways in one of those 25 or more uh, indices that I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my talk. What does come through though is that amongst older men and women uh, from uh, uh, predominantly North America and Europe, it doesn't really matter how you measure frailty. Frailty and its precursor, if you like, pre-frailty are common. So if you look on the right-hand side of this table, you'll see that uh, a score in Rockwood's scale there of three, uh, indicating someone who's quite frail, is present in one in 20 adults aged over 65 in Canada. Uh, and Cawthon in the bottom row found a similar finding in the US. Uh, um, Woods actually found a substantially higher uh, prevalence of frailty uh, using the freed phenotype, which obviously uh, does differ from the cumulative deficit index. But I think it's fair to say that frailty and pre-frailty are certainly common uh, in these data from older individuals from uh, wealthy countries. And the next intuitive question is, if we accept that frailty is common, uh, does it actually matter? So I would argue that yes, frailty is very important, and I don't think that will come as a surprise to anyone. And here is some data to support that contention. So from those same papers I presented on the previous slide, you can see there that as frailty increases using the Rockwood cumulative deficit type of index, um, uh, the risk of death increases quite steeply. And similar findings can be uh, had from other studies, whether you measure frailty using a, a phenotypic type approach or another type of scale. Uh, the presence of frailty is associated with virtually a twofold increase in the risk of death, and that's fairly consistent irrespective of how you measure frailty. So given that background, and I think that that background may be somewhat familiar to most people uh, who, would, uh, who would be tuning in today, um, I think the real interesting questions are, what do we consider to be the major knowledge gaps when it comes to frailty? And the specific knowledge gaps that uh, I think exist when I read this sort of literature are as follows. Firstly, given the sort of relative paucity of information from global populations, are there actually differences in the rates of frailty amongst people from different parts of the world? Secondly, uh, frailty has traditionally been thought of as a condition affecting older individuals. But to what extent does it actually affect people who are younger than that? Because that may actually be the seed. It may be the starting point for the development of later frailty as you get older. And finally, what I don't think has been explained very well is how frailty actually leads to premature death. We saw from the previous slide that it certainly seems to, but we don't know exactly how. Uh, it's not like a disease where, you know, you can die clearly of a heart attack, you can have a cancer that stops your vital organs from working, but we don't know how frailty actually leads to death. And so we'd like to try to address this in some of the research that we've been done. And we'll start by talking about uh, the global prevalence of frailty. So there has been a little bit of research done into this. As you can see here, this is uh, some data pulled from a systematic review looking at the prevalence of frailty in middle-income countries according to the World Health Organization classification of country incomes. And it is limited uh, to four uh, countries outside of high-income countries. Again, as before, it's limited to all the populations in these countries. And they have sample sizes which are uh, moderate, I think it's fair to say. What they show here is that frailty, once again, appears to be fairly common. What is challenging, though, is uh, whether we can or 
uh, whether we can compare these prevalence rates that we've indicated on this slide with the prevalence rates of frailty from high income countries or indeed compare uh, frailty prevalence amongst the countries on these, these slides. And the reason is that, firstly, the approach to measuring frailty differed from between studies. And secondly, even though they included, a, as a general rule, older populations, if you actually look at the age distributions of these populations, they do differ uh, from one another. And so it's very difficult to conclude whether one country or one region has higher frailty genuinely than another country or another region and exactly what the prevalence is. Here's uh, another piece of evidence that might help inform us. This is uh, data from Europe where they measured frailty using a cumulative deficit type of approach in community dwelling adults aged 50 and older. And they plotted the wealth of the country on the horizontal axis against the frailty index, that ratio I mentioned before, on the vertical axis. And they found that there was a, genu a general uh, sort of inverse relationship whereby the higher the country income, the lower the, uh, the prevalence of frailty, if you like. But once again, this data is actually limited to a fairly narrow bandwidth most uh, European countries are really high or middle income with very little information on low middle and low income countries. And also uh, it's using an approach which does have some limitations that, uh, that we can speak to. So I think that essentially the bottom line from my take on it is that we have somewhat limited information on how common frailty is globally and how it compares in different regions. Secondly, uh, does frailty begin from middle age? Um, so there have been a, a small number of studies that have tried to address this, but only really one that I can find that really looks at a younger population. And that is, uh, again, a study by Ken Rockwood uh, looking at uh, adults in North America aged uh, over the age of 20. They didn't uh, really try and uh, divide these participants up into uh, frail versus non-frail. But what you can see from the frailty indices that were reported in this paper is that even in middle age 45 to 64, there's a suggestion that frailty may actually be reasonably common with a mean frailty index of 0.16, remembering that uh, a frailty index of 0.21 or more might be considered to be frail. But aside from this data, there really is a very limited amount of information about how common frailty is in middle age and what it actually means if you are found to be frail in middle age. Lastly, how does frailty lead to premature death? Uh, that is something that I think there really is a substantial gap in knowledge about and something that we hope to be able to address in our research moving forward. So to get on to pure, uh, the PURE study, which is really the uh, title of uh, my presentation today, for those of you who don't know, PURE is a study of nearly 200,000 adults from 26 countries around the world. It was initiated by uh, Dr. Salim Youssef, uh, who's my mentor here at McMaster University. And um, it now uh, spans uh, every uh, inhabited continent uh, except Australia, which is a source of frustration to us, but uh, uh, be it as it may. Um, PURE inc uh, recruited uh, adults aged 35 to 70 with a median age of 50 years, it turns out. And these folks were all living in the community. Um, as it turns out, uh, just the slight majority of these participants were women. And it is a study that's been uh, being conducted for a long time now so that the median follow-up across all, uh, all uh, participants is approaching nine years. So this is a, a fairly substantial study. Uh, amongst a number of measurements taken at baseline from pure participants uh, was uh, grip strength. Uh, we measured it using a hand grip dynamometer, and you can see the image on the uh, on the screen there. And what we found uh, in a previous work that we've done was that uh, uh, grip strength alone varied significantly between countries and obviously between sexes. And you can see the various pure countries. At this stage, we only had 21 countries with hand grip strength measured. Um, grip strength varies uh, markedly uh, between, uh, let's say, countries in low-income areas and countries more high Income like Canada and Sweden. Um, but it was really this uh, piece of research uh, and what I'll present on uh, the next couple of slides that piqued my interest in frailty as a phenomenon. So having measured grip strength uh, at baseline in all these individuals, we examined the relationship between that measurement and the subsequent risk of death. And as you can see here, that for every five kilogram reduction or lower grip strength that participants had, the risk of death increased by 16%. And that was consistent for both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular death. 
And this tells us that grip strength may not be something related to any particular disease stream, but it might be something a little unrelated or independent uh, of a particular disease. And we went on to look at the relationship between grip strength and your, your case fatality. And so what we mean by that is if during the course of those eight years, or at the time we did this study, six years of follow-up, you developed a disease, be it an MI, a stroke, or a cancer, and you can see those displayed on the horizontal axis there, the grip strength we use to divide up into high, middle, and lowest grip strengths. You can see uh, the, on the vertical axis the case fatality rate, which is the risk of death after the development of any of these conditions. And what we've shown is that no matter what disease you got, whether it be an MI, a cancer, a pneumonia, if you had low grip strength in the blue bars there, your chances of dying were substantially higher than if you had uh, even middle or high grip strength. Um, this tells us that grip strength seems to be very much a protective factor, uh, or muscle strength, I should say, is a protective factor against dying from some sort of insult or disease. And that's a nice thing because that actually uh, ties back in with the original definition of frailty I mentioned before on the very first slide. Uh, it looks as if muscle strength is telling us exactly what we hope it would uh, when we think that it's a marker of frailty. So since doing that initial research on hand grip strength and uh, developing an interest in frailty, we then have gone on to measure frailty in the pure cohort uh, in two ways. Uh, one is using a cumulative deficit index using 47 characteristics that are measured in pure, and we use those thresholds that I mentioned before for considering someone pre-frail or frail. We also measured uh, uh, frailty using a phenotypic approach. In pure, we have only measured group strength, uh, physical activity using uh, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, and there was a simple question on whether there was unintentional weight loss of more than three kilograms in six months. And so we considered someone to be frail if they had two or more of those three characteristics and pre-frail if they exhibited one. So shown on this slide here are the characteristics of the pure participants divided into whether they were non-frail, pre-frail or frail and uh, how we measured uh, frailty, whether it be by phenotype or cumulative deficit index. What you can see is that uh, the proportions of individuals who are non-frail, pre-frail, and frail are reasonably similar, irrespective of how we measured frailty. Similarly, there wasn't much discrepancy between men and women, um, and, and it didn't seem to matter too much how you measured frailty. Perhaps women were slightly more frail when evaluated with a cumulative deficit index. What we also find is that as one might expect, frailty increases with age, so that's nice because it tells us that there is some face validity to what we're measuring. And what was quite interesting is that frailty is inversely related with level of education. Uh, and as we all know, education is an important marker of socioeconomic status as well. So that if we consider the frail phenotype, for instance, the higher the education achieved, the lower the prevalence rate of frailty. It sort of halves if you go from folks with only primary school education down to uh, secondary school, and even less for those who achieved a university or college education. Similarly, with the cumulative deficit index in the bottom right cell, you can see that uh, there was more than a halving of the prevalence of frailty as folks became more educated there. So it seems to be an important factor in what uh, leads to the development of frailty. What we also find is that there is a complex relationship between alcohol and tobacco use and uh, the occurrence of frailty. And I think it's fair to say that no very strong or clear pattern emerges. What is always complicated when measuring alcohol and tobacco use in these sorts of research is that the group that were formerly drinkers or formerly smokers have often quit smoking or drinking for health reasons. And those health reasons might play into why they might be more frail than people who are current drinkers or smokers, for example. So this, these sorts of data, while interesting, can be a little challenging to interpret. But what we show on the next slide, I think, is really um, one of the key findings from our point of view. And that is that uh, it doesn't really matter how you measure frailty again. As you move from high-income countries on the left side of each of these bar graphs to low income on the right side of the each bar graph, 
the prevalence of frailty adjusted for age and sex of the population increases and increases fairly substantially. And I think the great strength of PURE is that because we measured frailty in a very consistent manner across these different populations, we can be very confident in these, in these conclusions, uh, whereas other trying to sort of extrapolate from previous work that only measured one population and comparing that with a, a different study using different methodology is a little more uh, limited. What we show on this slide here is the relationship between frailty and the risk of death after five years. But what we've also done, understanding that the cumulative deficit index is in some respects a measure of uh, multimorbidity because it includes in it many diseases. We've measured frailty here on that sort of um, axis going into the slide uh, using the phenotypic approach. And we've uh, subdivided that into whether or not the individual had one or more or no diseases at baseline. So we're looking here at the relationship between frailty, level of multimorbidity, and risk of death at five years. I think what the uh, skyscrapers show us is that frailty and multimorbidity seem to have an additive effect. So that for every level of, uh, let's say, frailty, if you have more diseases, your risk of dying is even higher. Or put the other way, for any level of any given level of disease, the more frail you are, the more likely you are to die. In this Kaplan Meier curve here, what we present is the uh, risk of death in individuals who had no diseases at baseline that they knew of, and who did not develop any disease like myocardial infarction or cancer or pneumonia during follow-up. And what was really interesting is that, again, it doesn't matter how you measure frailty, and this is a recurring theme. Uh, it doesn't matter how you measure frailty, but the more frail you are, the more the risk of death is, irrespective of whether or not you seem to develop or have any disease. And so this is a really curious finding because it does beg the question, how does one actually die because of frailty? Here in this analysis, we did something similar. We excluded those with any chronic disease, and we looked at whether or not being frail and pre-frail predicted uh, death, as well as cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular death, after adjustment for a range of confounders. And those confounders you can see are listed there. And what you can see is the relationship is still pretty strong. If you are frail, even accounting for differences in age, sex, education, and so forth, as you can see, Frailty is still associated with nearly a two-fold increase in the risk of death as compared to someone who is non-frail, uh, and that seems to be independent of whether or not you have a known chronic illness. What we also found, which is quite interesting and almost puzzling to us, is that the frailty phenotype was not strongly associated with the risk of developing disease. So on the left-hand column, you see uh, diseases whose incidents were measured during those eight or nine years, of, well, uh, eight or nine years of follow-up. And you can see that there really was not a strong relationship between being frail at baseline and actually contracting one of these diseases, with some exceptions. So there is, for instance, a trend uh, towards a positive association between being frail and developing heart failure, uh, pneumonia, or COPD. These didn't reach statistical significance, however. But interestingly, there was no real strong association between uh, being frail and developing myocardial infarction or being frail and developing cancer. And in some respects, that is um, uh, an encouraging finding because there is some face validity to it. Uh, I can't imagine a mechanism by which being frail in and of itself would predispose us to developing cancer. Whereas if, let's say, we had found a positive association between cancer and frailty, one might be concerned that there could be reverse causation, where it was the cancer causing the frailty. So while that is showing in some respects, what it still doesn't really tell us is how frailty causes death if it doesn't in fact cause a whole range of diseases. What we did find in PURE, though, is as we presented for the grip strength, uh, being frail increases your risk of dying if you develop a disease. So again, we have those incident conditions listed on the left of the slide, and shown here are the case fatality rates depending on whether you are non-frail, pre-frail, or frail. And what is very apparent, as with the graph I showed before, the bar graph, is that the more frail you are, the higher your risk of dying should you develop some sort of intercurrent illness or disease. 
So basically to try and summarize what our findings are, shown here in this slide uh, is what I think is the classic model of death. And that is, we all start off, let's say, healthy. During the course of our lifespan, we will have or develop various risk factors for disease, and they may eventually lead to the development of disease. Uh, if you develop disease, you can either die from it or you can survive, and it may leave you disabled. But that, survive, that surviving individual is always going to be at higher risk for future disease, and so feeding back into this sort of cycle, which eventually leads to death. And that's how you know, we were taught at medical school to think of how one develops disease and dies. But I think that our research shows frailty may be, uh, have a very important role in this, uh, in this model in that if you develop disease, frailty increases your risk of death there. And so it seems to be a facilitator of death if you have a disease. But also, we found that individuals who are apparently frail and have no known disease and seem to develop a disease during follow-up do seem to be at increased risk of death. And I think this is a source of much interest to us and we need to understand this observation better. So I'm just going to finish up with the last couple of slides to speak to where we're heading with all of this. I think when we, uh, if we acknowledge that frailty is an important uh, phenomenon, then we next need to ask ourselves, why do people become frail? And I think there are a number of uh, players that might feed into why people become frail. And we can classify these as, uh, to some extent, biologic. Uh, for instance, you know, time itself uh, is likely to contribute to frailty. But so too might diseases and multimorbidity. And then there are a range of modifiable determinants, like your behavioral risk factors, and non-modifiable ones, like uh, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, for instance. And so you might actually uh, subdivide those categories of potential determinants of frailty even further. And people have done lots of research into these uh, different categories of determinants. For example, there is a clear association between shortening of the telomeres and the chromosomes and uh, biologic aging, uh, relationships between mitochondrial DNA mutations and biologic aging. Uh, in the next column, you see, you know, I think that there is um, uh, almost by definition a relationship between a physical inactivity and frailty and so forth. So these, this is how we can conceptualize potential determinants of frailty. What we are currently doing to try and get to what are the most important causes of frailty is we are in the process of measuring uh, frailty amongst the pure participants on the left-hand side. Uh, in those who survive 10 years. And what we want to know is if you are robust or non-frail at the beginning of this pure study and you then subsequently become frail, what has led to that? Incidentally, I should mention we have another similar data set that we're developing in prostate cancer patients as well. And so we consider frailty, as I kind of alluded to before, as uh, you know a, a number of potential contributors to it. And what what we uh, are doing is looking for potential biomarkers of uh, frailty. And these can be categorized in a number of different ways. Now, I've listed one here that's occurred to us as we've done uh, a scoping review of literature on potential biomarkers of frailty. And again, there are you know, many dozens of these listed in the literature. But what we eventually hope to do is use advances in biomarker analytic techniques called multiplex analyses whereby we can analyze hundreds of these biomarkers with very small quantities of biospecimen or plasma to then identify patterns of biomarkers rather than what is traditionally done, identifying single biomarker associations at a time. And we feel that these patterns of biomarker associations, kind of using the categories I showed on the previous slide, may actually be more relevant uh, in predicting who's going to become frail than any one biomarker by itself. Obviously, this is a big undertaking. Uh, we are measuring, as I mentioned, hundreds of biomarkers, and they can be categorized in different ways, and they will have uh, relationships with the development of frailty, which needs to be adjusted for by a number of confounders. And so we are starting to develop these very, very complicated uh, biomedical models uh, to describe how frailty develops. And I think that these sorts of analytics can very easily and rapidly get beyond the brain capacity of uh, poor folks uh, like myself. And so I think that we are going to need to leverage things like artificial intelligence to enable us to understand these complex relationships as we move forward and, and as our research keeps up to date with uh, the available technology for 
doing the research. So really, um, to wrap up and allow some time for discussion, uh, I think it's fair to say that both frailty and pre-frailty are common. I think we've shown that they are more common in poorer settings and in lower uh, income countries. It's very clear that frailty can be identified from middle age and has prognostic significance from pure, even from middle age. Uh, and it's also clear that you know, frailty leads to death by uh, increasing um, uh, susceptibility should you develop an illness, but also seems to potentially play a role in leading to death independent of disease. And I think we need more research to understand why that observation it might be the case. And so lastly, I think that the take home message for me is that reducing frailty, given how common it is and how important it is, may really be an underexploited way of reducing mortality and I haven't spoken to this, likely disability that can complement our existing efforts to prevent and treat disease. And so on that note, um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, that was really a great presentation. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Just a reminder, muting remains on, but you can enter your questions into the chat box at the bottom right hand corner of the WebEx window at any time, and we'll uh, read through your questions. So um, Nicole Ayamura asks, curious if frailty could be an indicator of recovery time and quality of the recovery. So um, would you like to speak to that? So recovery, I might have missed part of it. What was that recovery from? Was it Recov recovery from, from the illness? quality of the recovery? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take so it. The question is curious if frailty. I'm sorry? Dr. De Young, can you yes, hear me? Sorry, yes, I can hear you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to take it that you meant recovery from, let's say, an illness or even an injury. And I think the answer is, is almost certainly yes. Uh, I think that the less frail, you know, the more frail you are, the less likely you are to recover, um, and the slower you are going to be to recover uh, from any major illness or injury. I think we certainly see this clinically and anecdotally, and you know, this is something that could certainly be measured in research and, and almost certainly has. Uh, but I think that that conclusion is, is uh, uh, almost certainly correct. So speaking speaking to the definition of frailty and resilience or uh, ability to recover from illness, injury, exactly. So the vicissitudes of life. Exactly. So by definition, uh, frailty is a characteristic that enables recovery from illness or injury. Really, the more pertinent question is to what extent are our tools and uh, methods for measuring frailty able to detect that? And if you are able to show that these sorts of tools are uh, predictive of recovery time, then again, you have added face validity uh, to how uh, you measure frailty. Certainly. Well, while we wait for a couple more questions to come in, I'll go ahead and, and pose one. Um, so, you know, you, you showed fairly well that, that um, frailty does differ across countries. It seems to be... Um, an important indicator of frailty. Did you look at groups across countries? Did you did you stratify based on on income country to country and look at that? Yes. So you can divide this up in a number of ways. You can divide it up uh, by country income, which is what we did. You can divide it up by um, uh, also by uh, things like level of education. So uh, irrespective of where you come from. Uh, be it a high or a low income country, the more educated you are, there is uh, you know, a generally pretty good relationship or correlation between education status and socioeconomic status. And so when you do that, even cutting across countries, there's again a very positive association between level of frailty and education. So clearly there is something about a level of wealth, be it in a given community or be it in individual level wealth that seems to protect you uh, if you are wealthy uh, from a wealthy uh, community from developing frailty. Exactly what that is, uh, I'm not entirely sure. And I think it's likely to be multifactorial and we need to do more research and, and we are doing this research to understand why. Um, you, know, you might hypothesize, for instance, that it is things like uh, physical activity. If you are wealthier or from wealthier communities, you're more likely to be able to undertake recreational physical activity, play sports. Uh, it may, uh, may be to do with diet quality. So, for instance, you can afford to eat fresh fruit and vegetables, which are notoriously expensive in lower income uh, settings. Uh, 
it may be if with more education that you know that smoking is a bad thing and so you don't do it and you don't develop the risk factors and diseases that can lead to you becoming frail. So I think it's likely that um, these sorts of wealth related uh, questions about what is it uh, about being uh, wealthy that protects you from disease and frailty, I think they're likely to be complex and multifactorial answers. I think that these relationships are very strong and very true, but uh, we need some more sophisticated analytic approaches to understand exactly how. What I would take the opportunity uh, to do is make the point that it speaks very much to social equity. And I think that if we want to improve health outcomes across communities in Canada or wherever we happen to live, it is important to bear in mind that the more equitable the distribution of wealth in the country, the more likely it is that you have a homogeneously good level of health. And in contrast, if you have a society or a community where there is a marked disparity in people's level of wealth, you're likely to equally see a marked disparity in their level of frailty and in their level of diseases and, and illness. Uh, and I think we can all think of, uh, of examples of countries where, where that exists. And so I think that uh, uh, this is important for us as health researchers and global health researchers to bear that in mind and try and, um, uh, and advertise this uh, very prominently. And you, that's probably speaking also to how frailty may be a facilitator of death and not, not just a predictor of diseases that lead to death. I, I think so, yeah, absolutely. Would that be, that be fair to say, yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. All right, another Question, uh, what preventive methods are best for reducing frailty? So you're talking about blood tests for frailty, you're talking about predictive models for frailty. If as a uh, health uh, policymaker or a doctor that you say someone's frail or uh, is at risk of being frail, what, what, would, what could be rolled out to actually uh, reduce yeah, good question. the down, downside effects of frailty? So there's been uh, quite a lot of research done in typically short duration trials, like about three to six months, looking at exercise and diet. And those are fairly obvious candidates. And it doesn't really come as a surprise that if you can exercise intensively enough and you supplement, uh, especially if you have a nutrient deficient diet with things like a high quality protein, uh, that you uh, re increase muscle strength in that short to intermediate term and you reduce markers of frailty. Um, the challenge really from a public health perspective is how you implement that. And to give you some insight mm -hmm. into the complexity, if we talk about, say, diet, I think, again, most of us will know what constitutes a healthy diet. There is a lot of pushback or resistance to necessarily implementing that. So if you consider fresh fruit vegetables as being an important part of diet, to get them to remote and rural communities requires refrigeration to get them to keep them fresh. Uh, it requires a lot of cost because they are more expensive than uh, foods that have a very long shelf life because they're full of preservatives uh, and salt. So there are substantial difficulties in providing that, plus there are interest groups. Uh, so there may be uh, groups and lobbyists within the community whose interests are not to necessarily promote uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and high quality protein but whose interests may be more to promote uh, food which, quite frankly, is of poorer quality. And so when you put all of these ingredients into the mix, it does become very difficult for governments to legislate uh, for healthier food choices and practices and to institute things like taxes or tax rebates to encourage that because there are lots of different facets to these sorts of arguments. Now, with exercise, it's a slightly different story because I don't think anyone is going to debate that exercise is a good thing. And there is not, I would imagine, anyone who would actually be promoting uh, a sedentary or unhealthy exercise lifestyle. But the question really comes down to one of time, uh, accessibility, and adherence. Uh, just to give you an example, I've heard that in Sweden, uh, they actually, uh, the government provides tax relief for companies that allow their workers an hour a day where they are supposed to do dedicated exercise. And I thought to myself, that is a phenomenal um, uh, public health policy. Uh, and probably speaks to the white, white Swedes have, uh, uh, you know, such a high level of health across their country. And so I think innovative uh, approaches and solutions uh, to things like physical activity, like what they do in Scandinavia, 
is something that we could consider implementing if there's enough will, uh, and that would likely uh, help with preventing or reducing frailty. Certainly. Well, let's uh, do three quick questions and then uh, say goodbye. I'm wondering if you adjusted for healthcare infrastructure, public versus private healthcare, access across different countries, and whether there were any differences in prevalence of frailty and their associations with death. So, uh, health utilization or care across countries? A great question. Uh, we, to some extent, that is uh, incorporated into you know when we adjust for things like education education and uh, country income, but as you rightly point out, it's not completely, uh, it doesn't completely account for differences in health insurance and coverage. Um, these are data that have been collected in pure at, uh, you know, a sort of a community uh, level and is certainly something that we could look into. And that was from Lily. Um, Robert? Mine, after you are diagnosed as part of a cumulative disease, and do you not have complete confounding when you're analyzing rates of disease leading to death? So maybe a little methods explanation for it? Yes. So we've done a number of different iterations, and I left this out for the purposes of uh, keeping things simple. Uh, we've done a number of iterations of the cumulative deficit index, one that includes diseases like, you know, a history of cardiovascular disease, a history of cancer, and one that does not Include them at all. Uh, and we've also done analyses whereby we exclude individuals who have any um, any chronic disease at baseline. And actually, uh, irrespective of how you cut up the pie, the findings are still the same, and the effect sizes do not change very much from uh, a risk of death of about two with frailty. Uh, so uh, you wouldn't necessarily think it, but that's what we find. Okay. And uh, we have a request to review your uh, biomarkers one last time. The slide, you mean? Yeah. If I go back to this one here. I think so. Just to uh, maybe give a, a quick uh, brief overview of, of your biomarker set. Yes. This is not actually necessarily our final list. Uh, we're currently doing a, a scoping review. We're about a third of the way through to really get um, a, a bird's eye view of what people have done in the past and linked with frailty. Uh, and again, uh, like I said, the traditional approach has been to measure one of these markers or maybe two or three and compare it with some sort of marker mm -hmm. of frailty, usually in a cross-sectional manner. Um, the problem is that, you know, biology is very complicated. And when you measure just one, two or three markers, you don't really capture the complexity of what a human a human being is. Uh, so given these new sort of O-link platforms that we have uh, available to us at PHRI, where using just a few microliters of plasma, you can measure, I think, up to about almost a thousand biomarkers simultaneously. We now have the capacity to actually measure a vast array of biomarkers, and we're in the process of um, tabulating what list we actually want. Now, that these the, the the platforms that you use are customizable to some extent, but probably not to the extent that we would like. Having said that, I think that we'll be able to come to a nice list, a panel of biomarkers that gives us a good idea about the physiologic changes that are occurring uh, that eventually lead to the development of frailty. So this is kind of work in progress that we're presenting here. Certainly, yeah, that's fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Leung, for such a really, really great talk. Um, I enjoyed it, and I think uh, our audience did as well. We appreciate your participation in the CLSA webinar series. No problems. Thanks for having me. Thank Bye. you. So I'd like to remind everyone that the CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is September 24, 2018. Please visit the CLSA website under Data Access to review available data for their information and details about the application process. Oh, we have the survey back online. I was about to say, due to technical difficulties, that will be sent out, but um, it looks like it is up and running. I'd like to remind everyone to complete the survey located in the polling option. Uh, we would appreciate your help with uh, having our surveys delivered back to us, either now or after uh, we send it anonymously. If you have any questions or concerns that we can help with about that, write to us in the chat box and we can help. Um, and also, please remember that CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we invite you to follow us on Twitter. Finally, today is the first of our 2018-2019 monthly webinar series, and we will have our next webinar in October. Uh,
talking about the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium, or CANU, and its data linkage with the CLSA. We have uh, three speakers. We'll be welcoming Jeff Brooks, the CANU Scientific Director, Eleanor Setton, the CANU Managing Director, and Danny Duron, CANU Data Linkage Specialist, to speak. So please go to our CLSA website to register for our webinar, webinar series soon and join us for next month's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's presentation.